Okay, for our next culture, we're going to focus in on the Etruscans. The Etruscans are a culture that a lot of students are relatively unfamiliar with. It's a culture that's based in northern central Italy. Uh, so today, Italy, we usually just call it the Italian Peninsula in the ancient world because Italy, as we know it as a unified country today, didn't exist until the 19th century. Uh, however, you can see the area where the Etruscans were dominant. It was a society, however, that was pretty divided among different cities states. So we'll have a look at that and think about some of the different areas that uh, were producing art in this lecture. So an easy way to remember the name for the Etruscans is it's in the area of modern day Tuscany. So that's kind of an easy trick. And also uh, the Etruscans tended to work in different materials than the Greeks. Although we do see some style overlap, we do see different materials uh, that the Etruscans are using. We do have writing for the Etruscans, however only some of it has been deciphered. We, or people think that it is an orphan language, that it doesn't have any direct connections to other languages in the area. So that has hindered some of the efforts in deciphering the language. So we start off looking at the early Etruscan art. So this is a period from about 700 to 509 BCE. And this is the period when the Etruscans really are in power in the Italian peninsula. They are the most powerful area in terms of all these city-states that are uh, quite wealthy and quite successful in their trade. So it's a period, as I say here, of powerful and wealthy city-states involved in trade. Uh, there's actually a period where the Etruscan kings rule Rome, uh, which will eventually become a republic, or it will be a republic that will rule itself uh, without the Etruscan kings, and they will be ejected or expelled in 509 BCE. So that's when the Etruscans really, their power really starts to decline. And in what we call the later Etruscan period, which we'll see in just a few minutes, uh, this is where the Etruscans are really creating art more for the Roman cause or more in the Roman culture because uh, the Etruscans will eventually be dominated by the Romans. Uh, the Romans were a lot more unified than the Etruscans, which were a bit more uh, broken up into their different city-states, making it uh, relatively easy once the Romans had put everything together uh, to eventually defeat the Etruscans. So the Etruscans were experts in metalworking and terracotta or baked clay and in wall painting. And then uh, something to note, Etruscan women had more power than their Greek counterparts. So when the Greeks would visit the Etruscan regions, they would often note, and there are some accounts where they're horrified by the fact that women and men would dine together in public. Uh, so it seems to be that the Greeks were probably the most traditional and conservative in their roles for women. Uh, the Etruscans allowed them a few more rights and a few more opportunities to be in public. And we do see this a little bit in uh, the Roman culture as well. We have a lot of women, that were, especially were widows in the ancient Roman culture, had quite a few rights, uh, which we don't tend to see in ancient Greece. So our first work of art is the Cervetri sarcophagus, or sometimes known as the sarcophagus of the spouses. And it's a burial piece, a work of art that uh, was created in multiple pieces or fired in multiple pieces of terracotta. It's not made of stone. So again, remember the Etruscans were very good at working in terracotta. Uh, and we see a couple together, which is quite a pleasant idea, kind of this idea of them enjoying the afterlife together or enjoying eternity together. Um, they're clearly a couple of great means or wealth. Uh, she is wearing what's called a tutelis, which is a kind of cap, so that's a marker of status. She's also wearing these pointy shoes, another marker of status. They're on a very fine piece of furniture or a fine couch, so they're clearly um, reclining and enjoying themselves. Remember that people in the ancient world would recline to dine, so recline to eat. So here they're reclining together, something that the Greeks would find simply horrifying that you would have a man and woman together. Uh, we are definitely seeing some traits of the archaic period in ancient Greece also in these Etruscan sculptures. So for example, the hair is very stylized, the beard is kind of a single piece almost looking like uh, a shovel. And also you have the remnants of that archaic smile and very large almond-shaped eyes. So certain characteristics in Greek archaic period are also in the Etruscan archaic period. So it's important to note those connections. Um, but the idea here, the idea of kind of enjoying oneself, an idea of sociability being carried on into the afterlife. You see the spouses gesturing towards one another um, or gesturing to each other and speaking gestures. Um, she originally may have been holding onto an egg, so she's holding her two fingers there, and there may have been an egg here. And an egg seems to have been symbolic in Etruscan culture, possibly associated with ideas of rebirth. So we do see eggs featured in uh, burial 
uh, works of art. So just keep that in mind as we move along. And also uh, we can see that she's reclining on a wine skin. So wine was held in animal skins. And so another sign that they're enjoying themselves, that this is a nice and leisurely experience. Another early Etruscan work of art, or um, actually a, uh, basically a structure you can enter into, or a room you can enter into, is called the Tomb of the Leopards. And this is a richly painted tomb, so a very, very, very small percentage of tombs in the Etruscan world would have been painted to this extent and have the painting actually survived to this period. So um, if we go back, the Cervetri sarcophagus also would have been painted, but unfortunately the pigment does not survive like so many ancient sculptures. But if we move on to the Tomb of the Leopards, you can see this, this is richly painted. The paint luckily does survive. We have leopards up in the area that's a bit like a pediment in a temple, this triangular area. The leopards uh, would be associated with ideas of warding off evil, so apotropaic function. We see women and men reclining together on couches, similar to, in a similar way to the uh, sarcophagus of the spouses or the Cervetri sarcophagus that we just saw. Uh, so the Cervetri sarcophagus was found in an area called Cervetri, so that's where the name comes from. This tomb, however, is from Tarquinia, so Tarquinia was another Etruscan site. But again, emphasizing ideas of sociability, the men and women are enjoying themselves while they're dining, they're being tended to by servants who are bringing them uh, drinks, and also on the walls on the side here, which unfortunately we can't see, um, you have musicians that are playing music for them. So again, continuing to enjoy their time in the afterlife. And presumably this would emulate a kind of tent that would be put up uh, on the occasion of burial and funerals. So uh, kind of a funerary tent that's put up in perpetuity uh, with this kind of colorful checkerboard cloth up at the top. Another interesting painted tomb is what's called the Tomb of Hunting and Fishing, also in Tarquinia. So Tarquinia is a site where we see particularly richly painted tombs. So you have, uh, again, a couple reclining together, so a man and a woman. She's wearing her tutelis. Both of them are being tended to by servants, um, bringing them drink and food. And then down below, you have figures that are enjoying themselves. They're hunting. Uh, one has a slingshot here. One's fishing over here. You see little dolphins jumping out and birds flying. So presumably, you're enjoying yourself into the afterlife, you're engaging in an activity or a recreation that was enjoyable for you. Um, but in addition to that, some people have thought that perhaps the water, which runs along the bottom, could be a hint towards Etruscan ideas of the afterlife. Was there a conception of a watery afterlife? And also the idea that the dolphins are included, you do have these little dolphins leaping. Uh, there was an idea that dolphins were the souls of sailors that had died in shipwrecks. So those are also very sociable animals. And so some people, it seems, believed that there could have been some kind of afterlife connection there between animals and humans. So that's one idea that has been put forth. So a pleasant recreation, but also possible ideas about Etruscan views on the afterlife. Okay, and now we'll look at two later Etruscan artwork pieces. So going from about 509 to 500 BCE is what we consider the later Etruscan art period. And then really the Etruscan culture uh, is appropriated or brought into the Roman, the Roman tradition. So it kind of starts to disappear. Um, so Etruscan kings lose power. They are expelled in 509 BCE or BC. And these small Etruscan city-states are overtaken by the Roman military force. Etruscan culture becomes assimilated into Roman culture and Etruscan metal workers create artworks to glorify Rome. So at this point, they're really working on behalf of the Romans. So a work that's extremely famous, of course, is the Capitoline Wolf, which is a work that's made out of metal, and it includes these little figures of Romulus and Remus, these little babies that were added in the 5th century. Um, so this Capitoline Wolf refers to the Capitoline Hill, which is the political center of ancient Rome. And the story goes that you have Romulus and Remus, who were said to be born of a Vestal Virgin named Rhea Silvia, and the god Mars, and uh, these figures were cast out and raised by a wolf and so known as la lupa or the the wolf the, the she wolf and so you can see that she's feeding them and or suckling them and this is how they're going to be raised eventually the two of them will found the city of rome eventually they will fight each other and, and romulus will come out on top so that's why it's rome 
And so this is kind of the beginning of that story where these twins are being suckled by the wolf. So of course the founding of any city needs a glory, needs a very glorious myth or glorious story to go along with it. And Rome being in a particularly important city needs a story like with Romulus and Remus. Uh, there were other stories that went along with the founding of Rome, like the story of Aeneas, who was a figure that came from Troy. So again, connecting back to that Trojan War, that important Trojan War. Um, but in this case, a story about these twins that were said to have founded the city. Um, this, is, this was their childhood, so against all odds, they're able to survive by being suckled by a she-wolf. So uh, we believe that this is a she-wolf that connects back to that story of Romulus and Remus. Uh, however, remember that these babies of, that represent Romulus and Remus were added much later. But you definitely get the sense of a she-wolf that's re recently given birth. Uh, she's very much in the posture of protecting her young. She looks hungry but also ferocious. So uh, the idea that she's the she-wolf from the myth is not too far-fetched. And the last figure to focus on is known as Aule Metele or Aule Metellus, uh, and he's known as the Arringatore or the Orator. Uh, we have his name because it is inscribed on the bottom of his toga in Etruscan script. It's from Cortona, which is a city in Tuscany. So we know that he's an Etruscan figure, a figure from an Etruscan family, but at this point he's really been assimilated into Roman culture. He's wearing the toga, which is a sign of being of the upper classes because you can't do any physical labor in the toga, it'll just fall off. Off of you. Um, he's wearing the boots of a magistrate, so we know that he's reached a certain uh, social status and political status in the Roman Empire. So we know that he's uh, an important figure in the Roman Republic. He's holding out his hand in a gesture of oration, which is significant uh, as an Etruscan figure being brought into the Roman system. So oration or speaking was extremely important in ancient Rome. And so he's holding out his hand in this speaking gesture. Presumably his eyes would have been inlaid originally, which would have given him a very lifelike look. Also, um, there are there is evidence of a little bit of age on his face, of some nasal labial folds. Um, he's a very short Republican style haircut. Uh, so something that we could trust him, know that he is a guy to be taken seriously, someone who has experience and wisdom, all of this being reflected in his portrait features, uh, also the dress that he wears, we know that he's taken on the Roman system, and this gesture of oration speaks to the fact that he is a figure that uh, is familiar with rhetoric and can speak, which was again an important quality in ancient Rome. So next we'll be moving on to ancient Rome, to ideas of portraiture, and to the beginning of the emperors there.